I believe uh, to this day it was a miscarriage of justice. I lost my job overnight, lost my earnings overnight. I was living on handouts from my extended family. On the, on the 22nd of April 2015, I go to bed as a, as a, as a mayor of, uh, of Tar Hamlets and wake up. I'm no one. I lost everything. Lutfi Rahman was a councillor and leader of the Tar Hamlets Labour Group from 2008 until 2010. Initially selected as the party's candidate for the mayor for Tar Hamlets race in 2010, a new role, he was subsequently removed. He then went on to win as an independent, however, and from 2010 to 2015 was Tower Hamlet's mayor. Before in 2015, an election court officially reported Rahman to be personally guilty of election fraud under the Representation of the People Act 1983. Rahman was subsequently removed from office with immediate effect and was barred from standing for elected office until 2021. Now, he's back. Earlier this month, Rahman completed one of the most stunning comebacks in British political history, as he not only won the Tower Hamlets mayoralty, but his new party, Aspire, gained control of Tower Hamlets Council. Astonishingly, Aspire gained more councillors in England, 24, than Labour did, 22. Lutva, welcome to Downstream. Thank you. I'm really grateful to uh, giving me a chance to come, come to you and uh, air me out. Thank you yeah, very much. To and, tell, you, tell your side of the story. It doesn't happen very often. No, no. Uh, and uh, leading up to the election, I've been reasonably quiet and uh, to, give, to be given this chance uh, to talk to your audience, which is extensive, where you have a huge network. I'm very grateful. Oh, Thank my you. pleasure. Well, Thank our pleasure. For, for somebody watching this um, who's not familiar with Tower Hamlets, might be a, a non UK Navarra media watcher. What is Tower Hamlets? Can you briefly explain where it is and what it's like as a as a place? Sure. It's a wonderful place to be. Uh, it's a microcosm of what London is. Multicultural, diverse, vibrant. Uh, we have a interesting population profile. We have an elderly population and a very young population. And then we've got people in between. Uh, and it's a very nice place to be in. It's, uh, we have Kenner Wolf in our borough, the second largest business centre you know, in Europe, uh, after the city of London. Uh, we have a lot of opportunities, but we have extremes. We have, to, on the one hand, we have extreme wealth. On the other hand, we have extreme poverty. So trying to reduce that gap between those who have and those who don't have is the trick, is the trick. But it's, it's a gateway for the immigrant community. And it has been like that for centuries. You know, it's been the French the Jewish community, the French Huguenots, in the Bengali community, the Bangladeshis. You know, my father and my uncles came here during the 50s and the 60s, and I've been here since early 70s. I came here at the age of uh, just coming on to four and a half, five. Uh, then after the Somali community. So it's a very diverse, exciting, you know, and full of opportunities. And yet there are people who are poverty stricken. You know, yet, you know, uh, we have... You know, yeah, we introduced free school meals in 2012, yet there were children going to school not having a decent meal a day. So that's that's the kind of borough it is. Place uh, of extremes. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But more importantly, it's the inner city borough. Uh, we are an integral part of London. Uh, on the west, we have the city of London. On the south, we have Kendall Wolf. And on the east, we have uh, Newham. London of Newham, and in the north, northeast, we have London of Hackney. So it's eight square kilometres, uh, sorry, eight uh, square miles uh, of borough. It's a relatively small borough compared to other parts of London, but it's a full of opportunities. I mean, it's got, it's got. I think, 50% of the British Bangladeshi population is in Tower Hamlets. Is that right? It's something it, like it, that. It's 32%. 32%. 32% of the, of, the, of the British Bangladeshis uh, are, are in Tower Hamlets. Uh, and it's a gateway. Yeah. So, uh, so during the fifties and the sixties, our parents, our forefathers, will come to the UK through through Tower Hamlets. Mm -hmm. Will come here, settle here, then they move on to other parts of London. That's how it's been. So, a lot of the youngsters who grew up here, uh, gen my generation, uh, my younger generation, who have who have you know uh, have had their primary upbringing in. Tower Hamlets, we've moved on. Mm -hmm. So Tower Hamlets is the base 
uh, it's where you look to, you go to as a Bangladeshi mm-hmm. uh, diaspora across the country. So we're, we're speaking to you today because you just won, I think, one of the most extraordinary election results in modern political history in Britain. People might be saying, well, that's hyperbolic, Tower Hamlet's merit, it's a relatively small role. But you won, your new party Aspire has just picked up 24 councillors. For, for context, Labour in England gained 22 councillors. You gained more councillors than, than Labour. Um, and the background to all of this is that you were the mayor between 2010 and 2015, uh, but you were removed. So before we go any further, I just want to talk about that. Sure. Um, you were removed after a high court judge found you liable for election fraud in a civil case. Um but in 2018, Scotland Yard concluded there was insufficient evidence to prosecute any individual related to claims of electoral fraud. And this is what they said. They had not identified sufficient additional evidence or investigative opportunities to enable the Met to request the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, to consider the charging of any individual in relation to offences of electoral fraud and malpractice arising from the 2014 mayoral election. Big mouthful. What it basically means is that nobody's been charged or, or, or prosecuted with regards to breaking criminal law. A separate investigation by the Department for Communities and Local Government also found no evidence of fraud at the council in 2017. Now, you've got the, the London Metropolitan Police Service, you've got a government department, Department for Communities and Local Government. Were you wrongfully removed as the mayor of Tower Hamlets in 2015? It's a really sad uh, part of my history. Uh, very unfortunate. Uh, it obviously it bothers me because for me, dignity, respect, transparency, accountability was very important to me, has always been installed in uh, very important to me. My parents had installed in me the values of uh, dignity, respect, uh, and to be accused of things that I always maintained innocence and always uh, rejected was sad, was sad. I believe uh, to this day it was a miscarriage of justice uh, and hence I was vindicated by the police, by the PwC. Three and a half half million pound was spent on some four police investigations, Mm. Scotland Yard, City of London, financial fraud, you name it. Each, at each stage, they came back and said there was no evidence of illegality. Either me or any member of my administration. The police didn't even talk to me. My solicitors volunteered to talk to mm-hmm. the police. They said, look, look for, isn't even a suspect. We don't need to talk to him. And and, and the final uh, report came, uh, came out in 2018 that you just read out. Mm. I, for me... The people of the borough matter. I'm grateful that I've been given another chance, another opportunity to serve the people. That's been my passion all along. Tamlets gave so much to me and my parents. We had when I grew up on this, in a house and state in Bow uh, at the age of four or five. You know, my my mother couldn't speak a word of English. My father went to work. You know, worked in factories. Worked in uh, Savoy Hotel as a, as a porter. My mother was looked after by our neighbours who were white, who were English, who were British. You know, and and for me that's important. You know, I want to give back to the community that gave so much to my parents, gave my parents a chance to belong and to settle down here. And for me, that has been always my passion. When that report came out. It was a special electoral tribunal. It wasn't even a court, proper court. It was a QC, a deputy judge. There's no jury. No so jury yeah. who was judging me, who was prosecuting me effectively and was my executioner. It saddened me. It did really upset me. But I always had the faith and the confidence in the people of the borough. And on the 5th of May, I went this year, I went before the court of the people and again, like 2014, on the 5th of May, they gave an overwhelming majority for me 
and the Aspire Party. They want me to serve them, and I'm grateful. Mm. <clears throat> but I, I, just to stick with this, I mean, it is a remarkable story because you were prohibited from standing until 2021. Yeah, five years. Yeah. Five years. You were disqualified from the bar. Yeah. Um, uh, the, this is... I'm sure some people watch this, they might think you're guilty or innocent. It's kind sure. of, it's immaterial in terms of what I'm trying to say here because this would have broken most people. Sure. Whether or not somebody was innocent or guilty sure. or, or whatever, rich, poor, I think it would have broken most people. What you've done is you've not just won the mayoralty again, which you did twice before in 2010 and, and 2014. Your party now has a majority on the council, which you didn't have before. No. no. So you, you've come back stronger than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I, that's why I find such an extraordinary sure, story. Sure, sure, sure. But what you're saying here in terms of looking back on, on what's happened to you, it's almost like you don't, you're happy to talk about it, we're talking about it, but you don't really want to address it. You're saying it's a miscarriage of justice and bygones be bygones and now you just want to get on with government. I, from, obviously it hurt me, I'm a human being. It hurt yeah. me, my family, I had young family. I lost my job overnight, lost my earnings overnight. I was living on handouts from my extended family. You know, this is someone I qualified as a lawyer. I had secured a training contract in the city of London, got a good job as a solicitor immediately, and I was earning good money. And f money was never a problem f for me or my family. But overnight, you know, on the on the 22nd of April 2015, you know, sorry, I go to bed as a as a as a mayor of uh, of Tar Hamlets and wake up. I'm no one. I lost everything lost everything. It was a shock to me and my family. I was in a very dark period uh, of my life. But I always had the confidence in the people of the borough. So when I used to go out, people used to stop their car and say, you've got nothing to be ashamed of. When I used to go, my wife used to put petrol in the car. I want, I'm sitting next to her in the petrol station. Women used to come out and say, look, in the cars, brother Lutfu, you've got nothing to be ashamed of. Don't hide, don't disappear. You got none. You did nothing wrong. We voted for you. No one forced us to vote for you. Our vote was supported by no one. No one told us that we must vote in a certain way. We we grew up here. We now have to vote. We understand the system. Thirty-eight thousand of us voted for you. So don't be ashamed. That was constant message from the people of the borough. So that's what kept you going. It kept me going. It's the confidence in the faith. I I was able to keep my head high, despite what a certain quarter in the media and certain part of the establishment was saying, calling me names. I ignored that, mm. and I moved on, and I looked to the future. And you're not interested in, in re-examining that or at any point going back over it? Or At this stage, I have been given an opportunity. Yeah. I've been vindicated uh, on the 5th of May by the people of the borough. They're the most important people. 40,000 plus said, look, we have confidence in you. We entrust you for a vote. Go and deliver mm. for us, deliver for the people yeah. of the borough. And we'll, we'll talk about that because yeah. um, I think, like yeah. you say, that the, the tens of thousands of people that have voted for you yeah. and your party don't care about the personal drama. Sure. But I think for people, it's, it's an astonishing story. And I'll finish with this. As we've said, in, in 2015, it was a civil, a civil sure. case yeah. with no jury. It wasn't a criminal case. And it was brought forward by four petitioners. Yep. Yes. One was a former Labour Party Westminster candidate had been an advisor as well to a yeah. Labour... Mr Neil Kunek. Yeah, he'd been yeah. an advisor. Yeah. One was a, a candidate in the previous council elections for Labour. Yeah. One was a UKIP supporter. Yeah. And one was somebody who has quite a checkered political past of their own from the Bengali Re community. Former Respect uh, member, yeah. chair of the Respect Party, then joined Labour. It's just quite extraordinary to me. Again, this isn't to cast any aspersions mm. about who they are or, or what they were doing. But the fact that you can have somebody who's brought into public office by tens of thousands of people, and that can be usurped by four private citizens, two of which have connections to a, a political rival, you know, there's a, there's a quite clear conflict of interest. I mean, that's not to say they were lying or anything like that, but it's it's clearly a, an issue. Um, and then you have everything taken away from you. I mean, I, I think people don't recognise it was a civil case, not a criminal sure, one, etc. Sure. no jury. Sure. And I think once you explain that to them, they say, wow. How the hell? Because this was quite an archaic sure, piece of the, English law, right? Absolutely. And the best way that this could have been dealt with mm. is to put me through before my peers, before a jury, mm. you know, and let them decide mm. on whether we did any wrong or not. 
That wasn't the case. The police didn't even speak to me or any member of my former administration. Yeah. Yet, uh, one person, a QC, was sitting uh, as a uh, as a commissioner who judged me and my whole history, history, and decided in a report I had done wrong. You know, and the whole world thought that I had done wrong at a, to a criminal standard in a criminal court. And that, that's a sad thing. And because my... Which is not for, true. It's fundamentally it's not true. absolutely untrue. Mm. Because for me, being a person of accountability, transparency, person who respects the law and works within the law, it was so important. All I was doing there is delivering for the people of the borough. You know, and the, and the, all the investigations didn't find one iota of criminal wrongdoing. Yes, there were flaws in some aspects of our processes, but process isn't just my duty. It's the monitoring officer, it's the senior officer of the council. When you pick it up, you deal with it. And we would have dealt with it. We did deal with it. Do you think some of your supporters went over the top? Do you think they sort of... I... They made they, they made mistakes. Sure, I I've said it when I uh, announced my candidature that 2014 our whole campaign could have ran differently. Mm. I should have had a candidate as a candidate as the sitting mayor. I should have taken much more oversight over the campaign. I had entrusted the campaign in the hands of others whilst I was busy uh, running the council, delivering until the last day, just before the night of the election. And some companies, I would say, would have uh, did go overboard, did go overboard. Hence, this time, you know, we were in full control. I made it very clear: if anyone says anything unlawful, if anyone does anything untoward, then they will be personally liable. We all must respect our opponents. We must work within the law. We must work in a way that is fair and transparent and have an equal playing field for others. And so so many people, I think, as the results came through, yeah. um, probably have never heard of you. Uh, I mean, the people have heard of you, you know, obviously they're, they're familiar perhaps with the things we've just spoken about, but many people, you know, you've got millions of people watching BBC, six o'clock news the next day, local news, etc. in London, and they'll be saying, Look, Rahman's the, the the mayor of Tower Hamlets and Aspire has won 24 councillors. How do you explain such a stunning victory? Sure. Because obviously this hasn't happened anywhere else sure. in the country. Sure. And I think it's 60 years sure. since there's any council in London which isn't run by Labour, Tories or the Liberal Democrats. So how have you done it? I am not surprised at all by the result. If you look at the 2014 result, you look at the 2022 result, that's a huge correlation. In, in 2014, I had got, what, 38,000... 37 something first choice, first preferences. With second preferences, I got 38,000. This time around, I got 39 plus first preferences, another few hundred votes, 40 plus second, uh, in total, second preferences. So there was sent a much of a difference. I had 18 councillors 2014, 20, 23 councillors, 24 councillors this time around. The point is, we had delivered for the people of the borough. Judge, I say to people, my simple message was give me a chance. Judge me on my record. Look what we we had delivered for you, for you: free school meals, educational maintenance allowance, university bursary, eight thousand five hundred ninety homes for rent. All that over the last seven years had been cut. You know, huge cut had been inflicted on the people of the borough. We had five point two percent council tax frozen for seven years. Council tax has increased incrementally over the last seven years. Is nearly thirty percent, twenty nine percent when I uh, when Mr. Biggs left office. The cost of living had gone up tremendously in Tower Hamlets. People with the road closures too. Mm-hmm. People were fed up with the carts, the road closures, with crime. They needed change. They wanted change. They had said on two occasions in 2019, 7th of February, in a in the by-election mm. in uh in Shadwell Ward, a spy party had won its first uh, councillor, they made a clear noise. We want change. We overtook. We overturned Labour majority in the referendum on the sixth of uh, May last year, by a huge majority, sixty-three thousand to seventeen thousand. People said 
we want to keep the mail, mail system. I had let that. A spy had let that. Which is very unusual. Huh? Like you see what's happened in, in Bristol recently, they voted to get rid of it. So. Absolutely. But people understood that that one vote they have is their power to change and influence the power, uh, the politics of Thai Hamdas. They understood, they understood that. We were clear in the messaging. On the 12th of August last year, we had won a second by-election. Aspire, Councillor Kabir Ahmed, overturned another huge majority of Labour. On three occasions, people said, we want change. And we were able to galvanise, uh, able to uh, connect with the people of the borough. And I had never left them. You know, I was walking the streets of the borough. I'd go into, I was going to shops. I was going to the centres. I was going to the markets. I will come across people. Each time I come across them, they will shake my hands. They will say, look, walk with your head held high. You are not to be ashamed of, and we want you to come back. And I will say, look, I need to sort myself out first. I'm not sure. But when I decided uh, that I'm going to help and, and be part of the politics of Tahamdas, this was the third week of 2021, when we said we're going to campaign to keep the mail system. So for some, so January last year, last year for yeah. for one and a half year in the pandemic, you know we were campaigning from our homes, from personal contacts, word of mouth. You couldn't go out, and we had we were able to secure and keep the mail system. From June last year, we were out on the doors of the people of the borough, knocking on every door, talking to every person that we came across. That do you want change? Yes, let me and let us be that vehicle for change. And we were able to deliver that change on the 5th of May. So the, 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 the sort of brief answer is, how did they do this? You've got a record of actually delivering. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, the, and the Labour Party, and so you're saying the Labour administration in the meantime was a, a failure effectively. It was, it was absolutely. It had inflicted so much cut. Was we, there anything that they did that was good? Uh, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. One thing they good, did good was this. You know, uh, they put money in reserve rather than spend money unnecessarily. They could have spent that money on, on the people of the borough, but what they did, they put money in reserve. That was wrong. So I'm, I was being sarcastic there, mm -hmm. forgive me. That was wrong. You know, we have reserve of £750 million. Wow, £750, 750 million? million pound. In the city, poor borough, where whilst the mayor and his administration had cut services, mm. Youth service, we, we got such a large young people in the borough. We had some 48 youth provisions across the borough when we left. We, we, Mr. Biggs left only eight youth provisions across the borough. You know, youth centres have been closed. And you kept educational maintenance allowance, Absolutely. which was scrapped by the Tories Absolutely. in 2010. And we introduced is that, is that free, free school mill. Is that still there? EMA? No, it's been cut. The EMA has been cut. University grant has been cut. Under free school mills, they continued. So... What they should have done, they should have invested that money in the community, invested the money in the people. Yes, they had to take cuts, but not cuts at the expense of the people, not by putting money in reserves and loaning money to other authorities. £86 million of our money has been loaned to other, other organisations, other, other councils across London. I, so, think, I believe that was wrong. So this is maybe a quite a technical question, but 750 million is in reserve. Yeah. How much would Tower Hamlets regularly spend in a year? Well, I mean, it depends on your priorities, doesn't it? But what's the, because I'm just wondering if it's like a year's worth yeah, of spending no, uh, was kept so in reserve. Our, the budget from government, we receive one, some 1.2 billion pound in grants. Uh -huh. Yeah. Then we have other money. We have money from, from business rates. Mm -hmm. We have money from uh, rents and charges, fees and charges. You know, we also have money from, uh, it, it call, it's called Section 106, SIL, Community Inf Inf Infrastructure Levy, mm -hmm. i.e. any developers want to develop their Which is a hell of a lot of money in Tahamas. A lot of money. In that respect, we're, we're quite a rich money, mm -hmm. a rich borough. Quite a lot of capital money comes in each year. So we have a lot of money coming into the borough. It's how do you spend that money? Where are your priorities? Our priorities have always been the people of the borough, the youngsters of the borough. We were the only borough in the country that we had free home care. Home care isn't free now. We used to look after our elderly. We used to look after our infirm and the disabled and unwell. It's not free anymore. We want to look at how do we continue to help our elderly. Now, we would invest money in our youth service. 
we got to invest money in our uh, after school provisions help our youngsters we want to help our youngsters through education so we will seriously look at extending free university school meals uh, free school meals in secondary school we want to bring back the education and maintenance allowance again and the university grants wow. because we want to encourage our youngsters not not discourage them going into top universities rasa group of universities into oxbridge so let them explore the opportunities let, let them get get hold of their life and they can contribute back mm. you you recently wrote an article for jacobin magazine since you've um, since yeah. you won yeah um and you write we will use licensing powers to control rent hikes so does that informally mean that you're looking at rent caps for town hamlets we can't do that legally uh, as as far as i understand now the 2004 housing act gives us certain powers uh to license uh private rented properties and i think there are two wards in the borough which has been uh, piloted uh, by mr mr bigs uh for licensing through that legislation uh obviously you can regulate the standard of the properties and if their standards are not up to certain standard then obviously uh, you can find them but through that property uh for that legislation i understand that you can also ask the landlords to tell us what their current rent is that could be published for public domain if in the meantime they increase the rent you know unreasonably unfairly we can name and shame them but obviously we will keep an eye on the law what powers that we have and if we do get that kind of power to cap rents we will explore it to help the people of the borough do you think rents are too high in tamlets it is is pricing out and it has priced out a lot of money of course of course you know i know families you know uh, who can't afford the rent who are struggling who are in that loophole where they've been forced some of them to move out to places where the rent is uh, is cheaper and we want to encourage people support them to stay in town let's because they they've been uprooted forcibly uprooted from their families from their friends going to other parts of the borough have, have no connection to and that's wrong so when we were in power last time we had a homelessness fund to help those families you know 2 million pound home homelessness fund to help those families who are in who are in acute condition who couldn't pay the rent there was a gap so mm. we will as an exceptional mm. we will support them we help them so we can they can stay in the borough we want to continue to help those kind of families create another homelessness fund also want to help those people who are living on the streets outside it's sad you know just one week before my election i was walking down whitechapel road what will i just draw and to see people in sleeping bags in the morning you know in front of the id what will i do store it broke my which heart which people who don't it's basically the library in whitechapel yeah 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 it broke my heart it's a state of the art library mm. there were rows of people you know sleeping on the pavement mm. in in tarmlets next door to kenner wolf one of the richest part of of london of the world mm-hmm. it broke my heart we want to see how we can help them to provide shelter provide a home for them you've mentioned lots of great policies um which you had before which is just a matter of fact you had educational maintenance allowance free school meals which are still there universal free school meals um helping people who maybe are unemployed or they've fallen on a temporary hard time and helping them out anti homeless strategies etc 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 what what are the sort of policy priorities though for you now as mayor so in the next 6 months to a year what are the sort of two or three sure, things sure, that you're sure. most focused on the house building revolution that we started in 2010 you know it's last year, five seven years it was post we were the largest deliverer of social homes for rent in the country by the time i left in 2015 we had received 90 million pound in new homes bonus for the number of social homes we uh, homes we had built uh, in tar hamlets I want to continue with that uh, because we have many families waiting on the waiting list we have many overcrowded families which is holding back our children's education creating health inequalities you know i as a child grew up in overcrowded household i don't want our children to experience what i experienced so we want to deliver free four bedroom homes not one bedroom two bedroom homes free four bedroom homes more homes for rent so and it's affordable 
uh, we had promised 1,000 homes for rent per year, 4,000 of the next four years, more than that if we can, in partnership with developers, with housing associations and council homes. After 30 years, with the first council in London to deliver purely 100% homes owned by the council. Education is a top priority. Education improved my life chances, gave me a chance to play a very important role in the community. If, it wasn't, if I wasn't a lawyer, I couldn't have done well what I'm doing now. Yeah, that helped me so much. I want our children to have the best opportunities. You know? So helping, making sure our children have the best infrastructure, the best teachers, the best schools, you know, uh, that our schools are competing with other top boroughs in the country, mm. uh, in London. And, and we help our families with the living cost i.e. the education maintenance allowance, the free school meals, the university bursaries. Will that return, will that return in the next year or two, educational maintenance Abs- allowance? Absolutely. I mean, we've already you know, started the ball. Once we get the mayor's office up and running, we've got fantastic offices in the council. I believe I can work with them. They want to work with me and my administration. And we will get it, you know, we, we will get it going. <clears throat> so, so education, housing, crime, young people, young and elderly. We, want, we need to invest in the youth service. We need to invest in the youth provisions. We our children need to have after school provisions. They hang around on the streets. I grew up sitting on stairwells, you know, sitting just playing football just on a housing estate. No, I want our children. We've got fantastic infrastructure, you know. They're closed. They need to be reopened. We need to have outreach workers. We need to have youth workers <laughs> to engage with the children. We need our youth service to work in partnership with our schools so we have homework, after-school homework clubs. We have homework, uh, after-school youth provisions. So children feel they belong, they have somewhere to play and, and, you, and, and spend their life co- constructively. And also very importantly, you know, we will, obviously we will freeze council tax, but look after our elders, our infirm and the disabled and the unwell. This is a microcosm of the kind of big policy challenges actually across the country. So you're saying housing, you're saying elderly care, yeah. Um, you've said kids. One thing you've not mentioned, um, which is a major national issue, and it's kind of the w- the one thing that really sticks out from the, the policies that you stood on was um, low traffic neighbourhoods. So for mo- for most people, they would say, well, I- and you you do talk openly about the climate crisis, and you say we have to address it and clean air, etc. But they would say, well, if you're serious about the climate crisis and clean air and mm-hmm. You know, tens of thousands of people die from air pollution every year in this country, then surely we would have low traffic neighborhoods and we would be driving fewer cars. So, why was that a central part of your campaign? Sure, sure. I'll tell you why. First of all, I want for for my children, my grandchildren, clean air. I want my children to live long and live, and my grandchildren to live healthily. So, having a carbon neutral borough and a world where carbon dioxide isn't a problem, it's important to all of us, the future of the planet. But we have to be realistic. How do we achieve that? You know, we have a borough, where where, we're in a city borough, we have so many roads and trunk roads, by closing the inner roads, smaller roads, Mm. and diverting traffic to the main arteries is an answer. I said that from day one, not only me, experts have said it too. Now, I can see what's happening. What, what, has, what it has done, it has diverted traffic from the smaller inner state roads into the bigger arteries, as a result of which there's more traffic. People are, well, whilst they can travel through Tamlets mm. or in parts of Tamlets within 15, 20 minutes, they're sitting on the main roads in Whitechapel, Bethnal Green, Commercial Road, the highway. Mm for one hour at a time. Basically, Mile End. The Ma- Mile End, absolutely. That's, that's the A10, yeah? yeah? A10, Mile End Road, Stepney, Whitechapel. They're sitting in there for a far longer period mm. than they would if the other roads were open. They whiz through, yeah? So more fuel has been consumed, more carbon dioxide has been produced, and people are fed up of waiting in traffic, waiting in traffic. That wasn't the way to manage air pollution. Is there any data on that? I mean, that's interesting. If you're, if you're saying, because that sounds like a really compelling counter argument, if you're sure. saying that people were still driving their cars, it's just yeah. the, the engines turned on, they're not going anywhere. Believe is me, there any data on that? Because that's really... I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. 
Uh, I'm sorry if I can't quote to the that's data. That's fine, that's fine. But I talk to you from my experience. Yeah. And, and let me say, I'll say this to you on a practical level. See, in the city borough, a lot of our, you know, residents are Uber drivers. It's for necessity for, for the living, for the earning. That's a really compelling answer because for me, I like I like uh, low traffic neighbourhoods. I, I, in, in the abstract, I think they can often work. I think often they're implemented poorly. And the problem then is obviously when you have a new idea and it's executed badly, then people don't like it anymore. So it's better to not do anything at all. Um than do something poorly. But what you're saying with the specifics of Tower Hamlets is really interesting that actually lots of people from the borough are drivers and these are the people whizzing, you know, the the more affluent people from other boroughs, maybe Islington, maybe Hackney, maybe elsewhere in London, they might get that Uber once a month and it's part of their quote-unquote low-carbon lifestyle because they don't have a car, but they're just outsourcing those emissions to the people that vote for you who are tends to be lower income, tends Thank to be you. from minority backgrounds. Thank you. Is that a- accurate? Absolutely, absolutely. But what it, it has done at the same time, and this is what saddens me, is that they have created gated communities. The roads have been pedestrianised, have been closed, where there's nice terrace houses, terraced houses, expensive houses, you know, uh, where people are quite affluent, mm. you know, it's okay for them to have a low carbon dioxide, you know, uh, area patch, but most of the traffic is going through nearby council estates, housing estates, which is densely built, which which is cars emitting more carbon dioxide. That's a huge traffic each day, every hour. And it's affecting certain kind of people. So the point is, no, we are we must care for work for the whole borough. We can't create a class divide in the borough. It's okay for the affluent to have a carbon free, you know, estate or mm. road and no not okay for people who are don't have the money, don't have the affluence, you know, or the or the power, the influence. Mm. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. So we want that's the number of reason why I want to remove uh, the uh, the road closures. All of them? Uh, no, we will we'll do it sensibly. Mm. Where it works, it should remain. But where it isn't working, and we can see it isn't working, where it's creating more traffic, they should come out immediately. The further issue about the road closure was this. There, there wasn't proper consultation. It was imposed from the top. Uh, the council had set aside millions of pounds, closing roads, in the pretext of uh, reducing carbon dioxide, but it didn't work. It created more traffic, created more carbon dioxide, and people's time was spent in sitting in the cars, with the in- engine engine on. Of course, we want to reopen our roads. We will talk to people. We will listen to what the, what, what they have to say. But what I want to say is this: we will set up a climate task force. We want to look at how we can offset the roads opening by instituting innovative green policies, environmental environmental friendly policies, where they will come up with ideas, with policies, which could seriously have an effect in reducing carbon dioxide in the borough. So after you won, your predecessor, John Biggs, the the Labour Mayor of Tower Hamlet, said, and I quote, we're potentially quite a divided community. His i.e. your campaign, was totally focused on one community. I presume he means the Bangladeshi community. His administration is 25 men, all from one community. So here's a picture coming up here of Aspire's councillors. There's 24, there's obviously you. That's all brown men. Uh, I have to say underrepresented in national politics. But in Tower Hamlets, it's clearly, like he says, one part of the community. Now, personally for me, I I have no issue with it all being brown people. But there is clearly a lack of a sure, gender mix. Sure, so sure. How, how do you explain that? Sure, sure. I say to people, please judge me and my administration on our record. Judge us on our policies and our pledges. What we delivered during the seven years we were in power, free school meals, education, uh, 8,590 uh, homes for rent, you know, free home care, we did it and we benefited 
each and every member of our community, irrespective of race mm. or gender. Going forward, please look at our progressive, robust policies. It's to serve and to benefit the people of the borough. They are universal policies to benefit the whole borough. Mm. It's not just to cater for one community. Okay. But the, the, so however, just, however, just, however, just, just I'll just quickly yeah, sell the please, gender thing. Sorry, please, because please, because yeah. also in your defence, yeah. you did previously as mayor promote um, some very talented Bangladeshi sure. women. One Rabina Khan lost yeah. her her ward as a Lib Dem sure. to one of your candidates. Sure. So I'm wondering. I mean, is th- th- there must be many talented Bangladeshi women in in South Hamlets that could have stood for a spire. Absolutely, we had another uh, intelligent lady, Rani Khan. You know, uh, no, no, it was my head of uh, culture, leading my culture portfolio. Extremely, she's a teacher, extremely wonderful, able uh, young lady, young lady. So we've only been a party formed in 2017, whilst the established party has been around for more than 100 years. Of course, you know, it, it bothers me. It saddens me that we don't have a woman in the cabinet. We don't have a woman, you know, who will be who'll, uh, been elected as our councillor. We put forward, the party had put forward three women to be elected as councillors. Unfortunately, none of them got elected. The party is separate from me. I am beholden to the party. My selection has, is the gift of the party. As far as I know, the party had tried its best to recruit women, recruit uh, potential candidates from the other communities, non-Bengali communities, as members, as councillors, they, they weren't able to attract as many as possible during the short period that they, they had tried. But can I just say this to you? For me, women had played a very important role in my, in my personal life. My mother had a huge influence on my upbringing. My, my, my wife has a huge influence or my current state of affairs, mm. my sisters do, you know, and my, my daughter does, you know, for me, she's the boss, my daughter is the boss mm. for me. What I say to you is this, my head of office was a woman, was a black woman. We had many prominent women playing a critical role in our administration in the first time round. No, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Going forward, believe me, women will have a big role. The Labour Party got to where it got to after 100 years. They have now, I understand, scratched the old uh, woman's shortlist. Mm. Yeah, we been in power now. We have many women supporting me. In fact, more women voted for me than men did. Well, this is this. I mean, this is partly part of the puzzle, then, yeah. isn't it? And I, and I think I, yeah. I don't dispute that for a moment. Yeah. And I, you know, I've spoken to many Tower Hamlets residents who voted for you, yeah. or women. So, I mean, that would suggest it should be relatively yeah. easy for you to be yeah. able to recruit them as candidates. No, sure, we had because they're attracted to the policies. Sure, we. We, we approached, the party approached a lot of women. I approached a lot of women, pleaded with them, begged them. We are supporting you. We're going to back you all the way. And we're going to stick with you once you get elected. But because of work commitments, because of family commitments, because of young families, because of the stigma that was atta- associated with me after 2014, you know, what the media, the media onslaught. A lot of women were quite scared, quite scared to come forward to associate with me in that political way. But as things have changed now, Mm. and hopefully the narrative will also change, and we can deliver, I think, next time round, we'll have more women involved in our politics, involved in our uh, aspiration going forward. What was the, what was the, what were the prerequisites to to be an Aspire candidate? How how were they selected? Because obviously you've gone through such a unique experience. I would presume you you select people on the basis of reliability. Sure. Uh, they're not going to sort of flake out at the first sure. obstacle. The party has its own constitution, has its own rules, and the office of the party did the recruiting, the selection uh, of the candidates. You know, uh, and it, it, it's a quite vigorous process, and it's a quite an open, transparent process. Certainly, you must show an interest. You've got to be a member of the party. Uh, you must be loyal, certainly. But more, more importantly, you could have a clean record and the will to serve the people of the borough. You know, the fundamental policies any party would have in recruiting its potential councillor or male, male candidates. They went through a rigorous process. Rigorous process. 
Do, do you think the Labour Party takes the Muslim vote for granted? I don't think no one should. No one should take anyone's vote for granted. You know, I never take anyone's vote for granted. I was out at the doorstep of the people since June 2021. I was talking to people, phoning people from the third week of January 2021 for the S for Mayor campaign. I believe in working extremely hard. About some doors I went three, four times. You know, I've always done that. You know, you've got to have a rapport with the people, connection with the people, they must trust you. They must think you are one of them. You know, uh, what the Labour Party takes people's, anyone's vote for granted or not is, is for them. But believe me, I don't take no one's vote for granted. But Because I, I, obviously, as a, as a perfectly acceptable answer, but what, you, what you've achieved has potentially political implications beyond Tower Hamlets. Because there are other parts of the country with a similar sort of def- demographic complexion. So you think of the West Midlands, you know, it's not um, uh, people of, of Bengali heritage, but Kashmiri. Um, uh, you see what happens in Batley and Spen. You know, uh, George Galloway came third. I think he got something like 8,000 votes. The Labour candidate gets 11,000 votes. The Tory almost gets in. Regardless, okay, he didn't almost win, but it, it changed the, the local political dynamics. And I suppose the question is, well, if, if Muslim voters abandon Labour in their droves in Tower Hamlets, which they clearly have done now multiple times, I wonder, is that applicable el- elsewhere? And I think it, it possibly is in, in several constituencies. And the point is, will it happen if Labour continue to take those voters for granted? I mean, you, you're saying that's not your business. Maybe it isn't. I, I, think, I think they do take them for granted. And I, you know, I'll give you an example. The very first time that Keir Starmer, as leader of the Labour Party, mentions Palestine, to the best of my recollection, is the day before the Batley and Spen by-election, where you have this massive Muslim vote. And that's the first time he mentions it. And I think that's almost, I mean, it's just so obscenely obvious to me that he, he's taking Muslim voters for granted and then he's sort of calling it at the last minute, which actually, when you've got people doing what you do, like you say, on the doors, three, four times a personal relationship with people, that doesn't work. And so, I, 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 so I'll i reformulate the question, I think. Do you think the Labour going forward could have problems with Muslim voters in, in four, five, six seats across the country sure. at the next general election? Well, if they fail to have that rapport of that connection with the constituents, if they fail to put forward radical progressive policies which will directly benefit the constituents, I believe people will revolt. I believe people will want to change. I believe people would want not want to vote for them. And this is what happened in Hamlets. You know, we understood the pulse of the people. We have a connection with the people of the borough. And we put forward radical ideas, policies, that would benefit the working people, the ordinary people of Tower Hamlets. Based on that, people entrusted us with the vote, which for which we are grateful. Based on that, we would ensure that we will deliver on the promises that we made leading up to 5th of May. So you see, you've got so many Labour people coming out for you, sort of uh, trying to sort of out for Lot of Rahman, but you're still being quite dignified. Even actually the judge in this civil case with you, he said you were polite. And I, I was saying before we came on air that um, obviously you've had seven very difficult years. Maybe you, weren't, you were here when I said this. You've got no lines on your face. You're very stress-free. What, what keeps you so... Uh, so happy. You said it's the, the local community energizes you. But you seem very sure. positive, optimistic. You're not criticizing anyone. And personally, if I'd gone through what you'd gone through, I think I'd be very different. We did nothing wrong. Believe me. I've always maintained my innocence, innocence. That what gives me the upper hand over them. Yes, we had I had cons- constant name calling, personal attacks. It saddened me sometimes. And I said in my opening speech in the town hall, I pray for those people, I forgive them, and I forget what they've done to me. But you know what, for me, it's about the future. I can dwell on the past. I can dwell on who's called me names or called me what, but that that doesn't give me solace. That doesn't help me to bring about the change that I want to bring in. I, I believe in the people of the borough. I believe in our ability to bring about change and the fact that we've been given another opportunity, a gift by the people of the borough, that is fantastic. For me, that is the most important thing. 
You know, I don't want to get into a battle with anyone. It's about the future. It's not the past. So final question. Is Aspire going to stand candidates in Westminster elections in the future? And would, would you stand... I mean, that would be an amazing combination to your political career, wouldn't it? No. If you were a member of parliament? No, thank you. Thank you. I enjoy doing what I'm doing. For me, making sure the beans are collected on time, making sure our kid, kids have the best of education, helping people with the uh, cost of living now, keep, making sure we look, up, look after our youngsters and our elders. That's, that's my passion. I've... Yes, initially in my political career, I had an inspiration uh, to go into parliament. I moved on from that. I want to concentrate on this. What Aspire will do in the future, they will decide. For me, I just want to concentrate on getting the team together and making sure over the next four years, we have a clear timeline, we have a clear commitment, 100 days commitment, 200 days commitment, and we deliver and have an immediate impact for the people of the borough. So you won't be standing, but Aspire may stand candidates at the next general it's election. For them, it's they for may. them to decide what they want to do for the future. Look, Rachman, thanks for joining us. Sir, thank you. I'm very grateful for giving me a chance to speak to you and to your audience across the country. Our pleasure. And beyond. Thank you. Thank you.